All right, everybody. Hi there. Welcome to the module of the Your Successful Team program about how to talk to teens about drugs and alcohol, a common sense approach. This is Joshua Wayne. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me here. So let's jump right into it. I think the topic is fairly self-explanatory, but I want to. here's what we're going to talk about in this presentation. Teen drug and alcohol use today why teens are really using drugs and alcohol, how to best address it with your teens, and then also how to deal with a handful of tricky scenarios. So teen drug and alcohol use is really just one of a number of risky behaviors. Um, you know, I think it's probably the single most concerning for most parents. I think a lot of you know, driving fast and being reckless and putting, putting themselves in harm way is, is, is right up there too and obviously Drugs and alcohol can only complicate or enhance uh, the, the ability to make bad decisions like that. But here's a sort of a little word word cloud that I found just talking about different risky behaviors. So obviously sort of drugs, marijuana, uh, wine, drunk, alcohol, some of the bigger ones that show up in there, um, it is probably no surprise. So let's just jump right into some stats. And I want to kind of take two angles in talking about this, about how much teens are using drugs and alcohol these days. I'm going to give you the official stats first, and I'm going to give you some unofficial stats that, that are a little bit sort of more anecdotal in a way, but that I have also consistently found um, teens to tell me this over the years. So this is... This is um, from a study from the National Institute of Health and the National Institute of Drug Abuse that was done through the University of Michigan. And basically, uh, if you look at the top line, eighth graders in 1993, um, and we're looking then at con contrasting eighth graders in 2013, and then we jumped to 10th graders in 93 and then 13, 2013, and then 12th graders in 1993, and then again 20 years later in 2013. And then the, the two subsequent lines talk a look at alcohol and marijuana usage rates. Okay, and these are done. These are pretty academic studies, and I'm sure they're they're very you know the very valid um, in terms of the way that they're gathering the data. Um, but I am going to share some different numbers with you, and uh, and can probably sort of meet in the middle in terms of really understanding what the reality is. But what you see in terms of alcohol usage, if you look at the eighth graders in '93 and in 2013, and then also at the tenth and twelfth graders, you see a decline right? 24 to 10% for 8th graders, 38 and then 25% and then 48 and, and 39% um, you know, approximately in terms of uh, alcohol usage. Now again, the, the metric here is percentage you use in the past 30 days. So it doesn't tell you who's using regularly, who maybe used 30, more than 30 days. That also gets very hard to quantify and obviously to get 8th graders and 10th graders and 12th graders to be entirely honest with you, May not be the easiest, may, may not be the easiest lift in the world um, to begin with. But again, it does give us some numbers to work with to just frame out the the nature of the challenge that we're dealing with here. And then finally, we talk about marijuana. When it is, what's interesting here is that there's a, a consistent increase, right? So you see marijuana go from again approximately five to seven percent for eighth graders, from ten point nine, so rounding up eleven percent to eighteen percent, pretty big jump, and then fifteen to 22% for 12th graders. Again, pretty substantial jump. Um, marijuana use is on the increase, and this is this a bit more later, but it's also interesting to think about how society, American society, I'm talking about, about how American society's values have changed in that time period, right? We've seen uh, medical marijuana laws passed in many, many states. Now, I think four states, maybe five, um, including the District of Columbia, where I live, um, have, have legalized it um, in various definitions and degrees. But all that is to say that the social values around it are also changing pretty dramatically in that time period, um, speaking of marijuana. So here are some unofficial stats, though. And again, this is, this is <clears throat> certainly by no means scientific, but um, on a number of occasions when I'm with groups of like, say, seniors in high school, and there can be some juniors in there too, so again, I'm, I'm not claiming that this is scientific information. Um, but, when I'm, but when I'm sitting there with groups of kids in high school, what they will say um, in a number of the areas where I've worked, which is sort of urban areas, suburban areas, around urban areas, um, uh, primarily, 
they'll say often that by the time they're seniors in high school on a regular basis, which I get is open to some, you know, interpretation, what does that exactly exactly mean? That 90% are drinking alcohol on a regular basis and 50% are smoking marijuana. Now, those numbers may be very high. And it's also entirely possible that based on what you're hearing from your teenagers, those numbers really check out. You know, again, it's hard to entirely know. I, I suspect we probably have to sort of meet in the middle somewhere on these numbers to try to get it, you know, probably what reality is. Suffice it to say, though, it, and in some ways it doesn't really matter. I mean, if it's, is it 50% of kids are smoking marijuana versus 32%, 40%? I'm not, I'm not sure ultimately how much that academic information ultimately matters. For me, the, the real salient point here, the, the important takeaway is that with teenagers, them having to make decisions around drugs and alcohol, it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. This is a core decision that they're going to have to make about what is the role of drugs and alcohol going to be in their life. It's just fundamental. It's just it's the world we live in today. Um, again, I mentioned this a moment ago, society's current transition, just to get a little bit more background, just to provide some context before we start jumping into strategies about how to talk to your teens about this. Um, you know, but I think there's an important question that's here, which is how do we discourage youth when approximately 47% of the country is either saying it's legal or it's a medical substance, right? And the thing to understand is that teens get this. They're watching this. They're listening to this. They're understanding that now Colorado and Washington, and I believe Oregon and Alaska have fully legalized it in their stores. And I, you know, granted you have to be 21 to go in there, um, but there are stores where they can go and buy marijuana or edibles or, you know, what have you. And then there's a lot of other states that have medical laws, um, you know, and I think that also teens probably understand that, you know, there probably are many legitimate cases where people who have debilitating physical um, problems are using it medically, but I think they probably also understand that it's, there's also a lot of abuse of that, and, and many, many people get medical licenses primarily because they like to smoke marijuana and they're recreational users. Um, and so I think, you know, they understand that in many cases, the whole idea of medical marijuana is smokescreen, no pun intended, for, for recreational use. So all of, again, this is to say is that the, the values have changed, but Kids are seeing this happening. Kids are paying attention to the dialogue in a country that is increasingly saying that this is legal or it's medicine. Um, and I really do think that that changes the context of the discussion that we're having. And I don't know that ultimately makes the critical difference, but I think it's good for us as adults, as parents, as, as teachers, as people who work with youth, to be aware of that, to be aware that the dialogue around this is shifting in the world we live in today. I also believe that Hollywood has a really strong voice in this conversation. There are a lot of, a call for lack of a better term, stoner movies that are marketed very, very much towards teens, right? So you got Pineapple Express here, Harold and Kumar, I think there's a, two or three of them. Um, this is the End was another big one. Um, there's probably a number more. Um, and then there's also a lot of influences in music where there's a lot of pop music, rap music that is talking about um, marijuana use and, you know, really kind of glorifying it, you know, making it seem like a cool, fun thing to do. So, you know, again, regardless of where you land on it, and we'll talk about some just ways to talk about it and think about it um, with teens in a little bit. But just, again, I think it's important to just be aware that, that, that your teens, you know, are probably watching these movies. Um, or their friends are watching these movies, or they know of these movies, even if they haven't seen them. You know, this is stuff that's that's available to them, and this is stuff that Hollywood is producing that is very much about creating, you know, a fun, cool sort of aura around around pot smoking in particular. So again, just part of the backdrop that I think is just good for us to bear in mind as we move forward and talk. So why are teens really using drugs and alcohol? There are two primary reasons from my experience about why teens are using drugs and alcohol. And we're going to talk about them in, you know, the first one is kind of pretty straightforward and simple, but the second one I'm going to talk about a bit more, okay? Number one is that they're coping with emotional problems. And the truth of the matter is, is that for the teens that are using drugs and alcohol to escape, and I will be honest with you, I don't think it's the majority of teens that are using drugs and alcohol for that reason. I think they're using it for the second reason. Um, 
that, but for, for those that are using it to cope, usually it's because there was a problem that was there before there were substance use issues, right? There was just other, other things going on in their personal life and their family life, maybe some identity issues or, you know, deeper psychological issues or, or what have you. Um, something other emotional was usually going on before substances came in and then the substance, um, you know, became sort of a secondary problem or became a way of self-medicating um, their issue and, and, you know, becomes its own problem, of course. And the only thing really to discuss when we're talking about those teens is how to get them help, right? Because if there is a real orientation towards addiction and substance abuse, um, it's not going to get not going to, you know, likely to just be a phase. It's not something that they'll get to, you know, party in college, kind of, you know, like so the second group is kind of more party in college. And then, you know, most of them at some point just kind of, you know, grow up and, you know, learn how to, you know, handle themselves responsibly because it just doesn't really fit into being a, a functional, healthy, successful adult. But for this first group, the ones that are coping with emotional problems, the only thing, again, really to discuss here is how to get them help and finding them the right therapist, treatment, intervention, counselor, adults that can intervene on their behalf um, and help them deal with the underlying issues so that, so that on top of whatever they're struggling with at, at an emotional, psychological level, that they also don't develop um, addiction issues and, and serious substance use problems that then you know, spiral into something other you know, extreme and, and, and beyond. So that, that's, there's really not much more to say about those kids, although we'll talk about some signs and symptoms in just a moment. And the second group is the group that the reason that they're, they're doing drugs and alcohol is because they're having fun. And I, and I know it may sound, it may sound so, such a simple explanation, and I'll, I'm going to talk more about that and give you some context for why I say that that's why they're doing it. Um, but they're doing it in social environments. They're hanging out with their friends. There are parties on the weekend. They're having a good time. They're laughing. They're social, the social barriers are coming down. They feel more comfortable you know, talking to boys or talking to girls or whatever, you know, whatever they're into, and they're just having fun. Um, again, which doesn't make it easy, which doesn't necessarily excuse it, but it's important to just start from a basic understanding of what drives the behavior. And again, I'm going to talk more about that. First, though, I do want to just give some basic information around possible signs and symptoms of a problem, right? The kind of, how do you start to, what might you be seeing for the kids that are going to fit more into this first group? Giving up familiar activities, so maybe they were into sports, um, you know, had some really strong hobbies uh, that they were into, that they were really connected to, and had friends through that, um, and then and then all of a sudden just really started giving it up. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily mean they're into drugs and alcohol, but it could be an indicator. Okay, or homework, their homework really drops off. So number two is also sudden changes in work or school attendance, grades drop off dramatically. Number three, a dramatic attitude change. Right, angry outbursts, risky behavior choices. Some of that may just be called being a teenager, um, you know. And I don't want to pathologize that, but you know, if there are it, having those kind of dramatic attitude changes, you know, sort of very quickly, sort you know, get, having angry outbursts and becoming difficult to relate to and talk to, kind of you know, almost overnight, um, starting to engage in risky behaviors could also be an indicator. Sleeping excessively, um, you know, going into sort of a, a depression. You know, a lot of the drugs that are available to them, you know, can have that can have that effect on them, especially if they're using excessively. Um, associating with known users and leaving other friends behind. This kind of ties into number one, right? If they were involved in sports and hobbies and had a peer group, um, maybe since they were young kids, and then all of a sudden they they divorce themselves from that group and those activities. And start, you know, hanging out with maybe other kids that have a different kind of reputation. Again, can be an indicator. Changing um, dress style, wearing sunglasses, or wearing long sleeve shirts at inappropriate times. Again, it could be that they're hiding something. Um, you know, you know, kind of coming in uh, with sunglasses on and just going quickly to their room. Secretive or suspicious behavior extends to that. Um, talking about drugs or drug culture extensively. Um, this is another thing, you know, par having paraphernalia, talking about paraphernalia, talking about, you know, getting drugs, making jokes about it at seemingly inappropriate times, um, again, um, could, could be an indicator. Um, here's a few websites, drugfree.org, helpguide.org, and usnodrugs.com. Um, again, I'm not going to say too much more about that. I wanted to spend most of the time talking about the second group, um, the ones that I'm saying are primarily engaging in it because they're having fun. Uh, because in my experience, this really is the absolute majority of teens that are engaged, that are using drugs and alcohol. This is what is driving the behavior. 
Um, you know, I think it's, you know, I don't know, I don't know a percent to say, except to say that I think it's the overwhelming majority of teens are drawn to it this way, which is not to say that they won't have substance use issues later. A certain percentage of the population always will have um, a tendency towards addiction and abuse. Um, but in terms of the, what draws them to the behavior, most of the kids are going to fit this profile that I'm about to describe. So one of the best models that I, that I like for this comes from a, a gentleman named William Glasser, who actually just passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and his original, he was originally known in the 50s for something called reality therapy, and he later changed it to something called choice theory. And he was just an amazing, he was a psychiatrist, but he was way, way ahead of his time. Um, he's just a really, really original thinker and, and just amazing ideas and, and just the way, the, the impact that he had, I, I think, on, on the mental health community um, and education also is just really, really tremendous. Um, I really recommend his work if, that's, if that sort of thing is of interest to you. Um, he's got a lot of books on a lot of different topics. He's got some great books, actually, for uh, parents of teenagers. I think it's called For Parents and Teenagers. Um, there's a great one on on relationships. I think called Getting Together and Staying Together. Um, and there's another. There's a lot of books, but there's another one called Just Choice Theory, which is sort of his sort of his summary of his basic of his overall thinking. But I, I obviously can't talk all about everything that William Glasser said. But there is one particular thing that's core to his work that I want to talk about here because I think it really ties into our conversation today about drugs and alcohol. One of the things that Glasser said is that all humans share four basic needs. And actually, you see, you know this by now because you've seen this in, in some of the, if you've gotten into the core modules of the program, I talk actually quite a bit about this in module number one. All human beings have four basic needs, love and belonging, power, freedom, and fun. Now, this is assuming, of course, that their, um, that their, their survival needs are taken care of, food, clothing, shelter, and so forth are, are taken care of. But very quickly, love and belonging this is about being connected to others. It's about having a sense of community, a sense of place, um, a sense of connection. Nobody, nobody is an island unto themselves. We all need to be connected. Number two is about achievement. Power is about achievement. We get, we get power through accomplishing things, whether it's getting good grades or having a job or, or having a, a relationship and that we feel good about or you know, any number of ways we can achieve it. It's through achievement that we get a sense of power. Number three is freedom. We all want to be autonomous. We all want to have a sense of independence. Um, it's essential to human nature. We can talk, you know, endlessly about that, but I think suffice it to say that it's just it's a core drive that we all have. We all want to be self-determining. And then finally, number four is fun. And this is often tied to social connections, right? We are all going to find a way to have fun. Adults do it, and kids are going to do it. You know, little kids, that's all they do is, is play and have fun. You know, adults have hobbies. They play sports. They go out with friends. They play golf. They play bridge. They play tennis. They play, you know, you name it. Um, or they watch movies or they have, you know, they like wine or they like travel or whatever, right? We all, we all find some sort of outlet one way or the other for, for fun that is, is, you know, something we're interested in that we usually engage with, with other people at some level. So the key thing here, again, is that teens are going to find an outlet for fun. Now, there are a lot of ways that teens can and do have fun that do not involve drugs and alcohol. But again, if we're being totally honest, it is one of the ways that they are, that they are going to often seek to have fun. Um, we can try to redirect it and intervene in it as, you know, as much as possible. And we'll talk about some of those strategies. Um, in just a little bit, but we just also have to start in the in from the place of reality and understand that it is one way in which you know people really from the beginning of time have found, you know, we were able we figure out how to turn grains into alcohol, um, you know, thousands of years ago, and it's in one way or another it's been something that humans have engaged in since. Um, so it's not like some new thing, um, you know, and it's you know people have always you know generally had fun with it, and there's always been a real downside to it and risk to it. Um, but teens, you know, are no different there. It is going to be, you know, it is a one common avenue that they're going to be seeking to have fun. Um, and a lot of that is going to also be tied to friends and getting together with friends and um, doing things that they perceive to be fun. So, you know, you, you hope it doesn't look like this, right? We all hope that these aren't the pictures on their cell phone of, you know, their spring break or their nights out. 
Um, but, you know, again, we need to be grounded in the realities that we all want to have fun. And one way or another, we're going to find a way to do it. You just hope it doesn't always look like this, right? So what works? If that's true, if my hypothesis here is true, that, that a lot of what drives this is seeking fun, what works? Okay. Well, by now, you've certainly heard me talk about this already, right? But I'm going to bring it up here again because it's just so central in my experience to what is important and parents' relationships with their teens, you know, not only just in the macro goals of the Your Successful Team program about minimizing conflict, about building a strong relationship, and about um, helping your team successfully transition to adulthood, but this is just so, so central to how you how you position how you get all of those things right. Right is about really focusing on having that, that strong relationship with them and that strong connection with them. Right at the end of the day, this is this is the most important thing because it's all you really have. You can't control every choice they're going to make unless you were to you know lock them in their room and turn your home into a gulag. They're going to go out into the world. They're going to have freedom. They're going to make choices. And your ability to control those choices is limited. You can't control them, but you can influence them. And just to reiterate, the key variable that you have working in your favor to influence it is the strength of your relationship. That is it, my friends. That is, well, maybe that's not it, but that is certainly the biggest piece of the pie here, right? If you don't have this, if you don't have a connection, they don't feel like they can come to you, they can talk to you, that you'll listen to them and you're not going to judge them or not going to jump into a lecture right away anyhow, it's going to be very difficult for you to sort of influence the kinds of choices they're going to make. So it probably doesn't come as much of a surprise then that, you know, regardless of what I'm talking about, in many ways this is the common denominator that I keep coming back to because this is no more true anywhere than when it comes to this conversation around drugs and alcohol. You may not be able to completely keep them from doing it, right? But you can keep the relationship strong and you can keep the channels of communication open so that at least they're talking to you, so that at least they're coming to you when they have real questions they want to talk about, right? So at least you have some sense of what's going on in their life. Here's the tricky thing with drugs and alcohol. If you take a, a very restrictive attitude towards it with them, if you prohibit them from using in, in any way whatsoever, if you say this is absolutely 100% unacceptable in our home, we don't do this, if you do this there will be severe consequences, you can say that and with some kids it may work. And I'm not saying you shouldn't say that, but I do want to point out the potential risk factor in saying that, and it's this. If you take that very stern, strong, restrictive, sort of hard line approach with them on this, and they decide that they're going to experiment, and just zipping back to my stats here before a little bit, right? Let's zip back to this for a second. If you, and, and if they choose, if the choices they make put them in the group that's at least trying things or experimenting things or maybe even using on a consistent basis, if you take that hard line approach, the risk you take is that you're just going to drive the behavior underground. Don't know what's going on. And my concern and my experience is that that's ultimately a riskier place for parents to be. So again, like it's hard for me to say blink in a blanket fashion what's going to work in every home because I don't think there is one thing that's going to work in every home with every child. I think it depends on a lot of different variables and a lot of different things. And you're ultimately going to have to figure out what is the right thing in your home with your family based on your values and your upbringing and, and your culture. But if you do take that hard edge approach, just I just want you to be aware of the potential risk factor there of potentially driving that behavior underground for them and then you don't really know what's going on because they don't think they can talk to you about it or ask their questions or if their friends are experimenting and they're trying to figure it out and sort through it if they don't feel like they can trust you and, and that you'll listen to them and you won't judge and go into a lecture really quickly they just may you may not know what's going on and that's 
that's my position. Um, and I think that in some ways is what you have to be very, very careful about. Because um, one thing that I always tell parents to assume is that they are much, meaning your teen is much better at concealing it than you are at detecting that. Just take that in for a second. Assume your teenager is much better at concealing any sort of drug and alcohol experimentation they're going to do than you are at detecting it. Even if I'm wrong, assume I'm right. Because I do believe it'll work in your favor if you sort of take that approach. Again, We've talked about this stuff in some of the previous modules, but just really quickly to run through it, you know, these, some of these aspects of keeping your relationship strong. They are going to talk to somebody about these issues. You want it to be you. That's your goal here. That's your North Star here. They're going to talk to somebody. You want it to be you. Again, you heard me talk about this before, particularly in the introduction. This is about in their perception. Is the relationship strong in their perception? Not yours. Your perception matters, but their ma theirs matters a whole lot more. Do they really feel like they can come to you and you will be there and you will give them your, your, your presence and you will listen to them? Doesn't mean you have to say yes to everything and just be their friend. You still have to be their parent, but will you truly listen? Again, if you want to be understood, learn to listen. Uh, I've already said this before. Be mindful about lecturing. Number five, understand their world as they see it, not as we think it should be. This is really important. When we're having a strong relationship, and particularly when we're talking about drugs and alcohol, we have to step out of our frame of reference about how we think they should behave, our frame of reference for how they, they should think about their world, and understand their world as they see it. Really, really important. And then lastly, we've talked about this before, and again, there's a lot more material throughout the program about spending quality time together. It's really no way to have a strong relationship with them if you aren't figuring out a way to build in that strong quality time. Here's the other thing, and you've heard me talk about this before in a variety of ways, too. And I'm going to talk in a moment about how you start to maybe structure some of that conversation with them, right? But here's probably, in addition to the strength of your relationship and learning to keep those channels of communication open and walking that tightrope, as you've heard me talk about, particularly in the introduction, beyond those things, Probably the single most other important thing you can do, particularly when it comes to drug and alcohol, because again, you can't entirely control it, is to have them absorbed in activities that drugs and alcohol would compromise, right? Like team sports. Like if they're really engrossed in a team sport and if they're on a team and they're, and they're committed to it and there's a peer group that they have around it and performance and being in good shape and being in, co in good condition is important it can be a way to mitigate that. It's not a fail safe because there's, you know, sometimes they'll, you know, a lot of sports teams will go and, you know, act crazy together on the weekends, um, you know, including drugs and alcohol. But again, the idea here is that if you can keep them absorbed in activities that drugs and alcohol would compromise, it's another way of helping them just sort of steer clear of that and certainly about, you know, getting to the point where they have a problem with it. And then another thing that can also really be helpful is, is having them involved like in one of these activities where there's an adult mentor they don't want to disappoint. So maybe that's a sports coach or maybe that's, you know, if there's a hobby that they have, um, you know, someone who's a mentor or a teacher in that hobby or a martial arts instructor or a counselor or a therapist or somebody at the school who they have a strong relationship with, some adult in their life. Maybe if they have a part-time job, it's, it's a supervisor or who they buy, buy into and they're connected with. If they don't want to disappoint that person, um, it could be another way that that could help steer them away from 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 doing drugs and alcohol. Again, it's, it's having them absorbed in as many positive things that doing drugs and alcohol would compromise. And then, so the other thing to think about is what are they passionate about? What do they really love? What do they really want to be involved in? What what nurtures them and makes them feel passionate and good about that is that are healthy things to be involved in? You want to keep your attention there with them as much as you possibly can. But again. Do expect that they're likely more skilled at concealing it than you are at detecting it. Again, I just found that this is a smart place to be, which is not to say you want to walk around suspicious all the time, but I say err on the side of being, of being you know, a little bit, just expect that this is true. Um, I think it will work in your favor. Okay, so let's talk about how to talk about it, okay? 
I think this depends on their maturity level, right? I don't know that you necessarily need to start in seventh or eighth grade, but it's around that time generally that they start to be a little bit more exposed to it. They start to be a little bit more, they kind of know what's going on. Maybe some of the older kids they see, maybe their older siblings, they not say that their older siblings are using, but they're just a little bit more aware of it. So I think you can start to have that conversation around seventh or eighth grade. And maybe if the kid's particularly mature or if they're older siblings, and there's just stuff going on in the community, then maybe you do need to talk about it earlier on. So again, there's no sort of set prescription about when you want to talk about it, but I found that generally around seventh to eighth grade, they're just kind of starting to become a bit mature about it. They're probably getting some kind of drug and alcohol education of some sort in school, so it's not like this is a foreign you know, you know, thing to them. Um, but So I think that's roughly around the time you can start to have a talk about it. And I think it's good to take the lead on this and address it head on, but I also think it's important to not make a huge deal out of it, right? Part of human nature is when something is taboo and when something is really forbidden, and not for all people, but for a lot of people, the more taboo it is, the more sort of appealing it's going to become or the more curious they're going to become about it, right? Like we've all maybe, you know, we've either been there or we've known kids like that, or maybe your kids are like that. You say, don't do this. You know, don't put your hand by the fire. It's the first thing that they're going to want to do is to go test it, right? So, you know, with certain kids more than others, you kind of want to almost be a little bit nonchalant about it, um, has been my experience. You know, I also think that, consider this, this is just sort of an idea that I'll share with you, um, but I do think it's interesting. And, you know, the data has come out that the D.A.R.E. program, and also the Just Say No campaign, if you can think back to the 80s, um, the Nancy Reagan Just Say No campaign, that those were pretty dismal failures. Um, I don't think the data has really tested out that those were not generally successful initiatives in terms of reducing drug and alcohol usage. Um, and I think, and I know actually I have a, a colleague who was a D.A.R.E. instructor um, and trained even internationally for D.A.R.E. And he's even shared with me that the data was really, really poor ultimately on, on how that program was. And I think part of the problem there is that, consider this idea, that the brain cannot think in negatives. So for example, if I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant. What do you do? You automatically think of a pink elephant because the brain can't think in negatives. You can't not think of something I'm telling you to, to not think about. It's just by the fact that I'm telling you not to think about it, you think about it. So just say no to drugs, don't do drugs. What is the brain getting? It's getting this constant reinforced message around drugs, drugs, because it can't think in negatives, right? So again, this is not to say that we just, you know, necessarily reinforced to do drugs for kids, but I do think in some ways the, the ferocity with which we as a society approach that issue almost could have had a counterproductive effect. And I think we, because we were so head on about it and so aggressive about it and made such a big deal out of it, I think in some ways it sort of, it could have had a, sort of a, the counter uh, effect than what was intended. Um, just an idea, just a hypothesis. I don't know that this has been, you know, totally tested out, um, but I kind of, I, I sort of have a suspicion that there's something there. Um, and I found that like when parents, when you can kind of be a little bit more calm about it, and not again, not make such a huge deal, start talking by, you know, asking them questions. You know, what do you think about this? What do you know about this? You know, do you, do you know of anything going on with your friends? Just building that rapport around it so that, again, the goal here is to keep the channels of communication open, right? So as you start to talk about it, it's a good way just to ask questions, not making a huge deal out of it. You know, by no means condoning it, but just not making a huge deal out of it, kind of just walking that fine line between, you know, letting them know that you're concerned about these things and, you know, but you understand that they're going to have to make these choices at some point. I think acknowledging that's important, but also not getting so worked up about it emotionally because then it could almost create an emotional charge for them that, that could be counterproductive. That just doesn't need to be there. So stay calm, okay? Pay attention to your timing. Get them when they're in a good mood. You know, this is just a conversation to have. Maybe when you're just kind of out driving around doing things, maybe just saw a movie together, maybe just had some food together, we're out throwing the ball around, doing some kind of positive activity together. Could be a good time to just talk about it. Hey, you know, I just, you know, curious to know, I heard, I heard they did they had the speaker at your school the other day, or there was a seminar about this. 
I just love to talk to you about it. What are you thinking? What do you know? You know, what's what do you, what do you what are your what questions do you have about this? I think it's just a way to start to um, engage in it. Again, I think as I just said this a moment ago, but acknowledging the situations they will encounter and the choices they will have to make. I think that's just good being grounded in reality in a good way. I know you're going to have to make some choices about this at some point. You know, you're at some point you're going to be at a party and someone's going to offer you a beer or you're going to know some friends that are probably smoking pot. Like it's just a reality that it's part of your life. You're going to have to make some choices about it. Um, you know, and I think the, the key thing is to be reinforcing that, you know, more than anything, you know, I know that we may not be able to control every choice you're going to make, but we want you to know to come talk to us about it. When you have questions, you know, we really just want to, want to talk to you about it. Um, you know, be honest with them about how you feel and tell them why and acknowledge that they will make their own decisions about this because, again, that's just sort of reality. Um, and I think it's just good to be in reality as much as possible in that conversation. Now, again, with some kids and in some families, maybe taking a very hard line approach will work. I'm not going to say that it can never be effective. Um, but again, I just want you to be mindful if you do take that approach of the potential risk, which is that if they do then decide to experiment, um, there's a good likelihood that it just sort of drives that behavior underground because they'll, they'll conceal it from you. Also, as you're having these conversations, remember you're planting seeds, okay? Um, the, this is not all going to, not all these, not all these seeds are going to germinate and sprout right away. You're planting seeds for things that may become relevant for them a couple years down the road. And it may not just be one conversation with you. This may be ongoing conversation. Again, I mentioned this before, but number seven here, let them know they can always talk to you. Do everything you can to keep the lines of communication open. Again, this is priority, right? If they won't come talk to you, if they don't feel like they can talk to you, you won't know what's going on. That's just a reality. Number eight, listen, don't lecture and don't dominate the conversation. I sort of indicated this before, right? What do they think? You want to ask them questions. Well, what do you think about this? You know, what's going on amongst your peer groups? You know, what do you see? You know, what do you think about these movies that you're watching? Yeah, I get that they're funny, but what do you think about what they're, what, you know, what, they're, what point they're trying to make about marijuana, uh, about partying? Let them know that, and I think this is, let them know that they can make the call when they're in a bad situation, no question tonight and what I mean by and the people that they're maybe the designated driver whoever's driving um, that, that night had some alcohol or if they're in a situation being served and, hot, and they just feel uncomfortable and they don't want to be there by the time they're that age they probably have a cell phone away and call you and just, that it doesn't matter if it's two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning or whatever, that if they're in a bad situation and they're concerned about their safety or if the people that they're with have been using and they don't feel comfortable getting in the car or if they just think that, you know, they're at a party and the wrong things are going on, just tell them they can always call you and you will come pick them up and there will be no questions asked, at least that night. You know, be honest about it. You know, maybe we'll talk about it the next day. We may have to have a talk about just some things, but like, you will not get a judgment from me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I want you to call me. If you're in a situation that you're unsure about, I want to come get you. No questions asked. Don't ever hesitate to do that. Let them know that you're there for them in that way. I think that's really, really, really critical. Okay. Hot topic. Let's do, go through a few. I've got about three or four hot topics that I want to talk about because these really, when I do this, you know, I talk about this live to parents and in groups and so forth, these are usually the kind of questions that I get. So... I sort of turn them into hot topics. Should you let them use at home, right? So a lot of parents have said or asked anyway, you know, well, I don't want them out driving around and drinking or smoking pot, so maybe I should just let them and their friends come over uh, and they can use in my basement, right? Or, you know, as long as they're doing it under my roof and I'm less concerned about it, you know, I'd rather them do it where I can sort of, you know, see it and I can, you know, have some control over it and I can know what's going on rather than, you know, them being out at some party or, or driving around and, you know, being in a, potentially in, in harm's way in a more significant way. Um, you know, this is a good question. I, you know, I know of parents who have kind of taken that approach. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of this varies on your particular opinions about it and cultural differences. Let me just first say, I think that generally this is probably something you should not do. Um, my experience is just just generally not a good idea to do this for a number of reasons. But I also understand that there's people of different, you know, cultural differences. Like, you know, here's an example. My wife is from Austria. 
And her brother in Austria, the educational system is a little bit different where when you're in high school, you sort of almost have like what we would call like a major in college or in a major course of study um, from the time you're like 14 or 15 on, I think it is. Well, her brother studied winemaking in high school. By American standards, that's just it's insanity. Like it's just, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to keep kids from doing drugs and alcohol in our, in our culture. And yet here they are. This is his publicly funded education had him making wine and making wine, which the entire time he was in high school, he came home every day, probably somewhere between, you know, a little bit buzzed and drunk, um, probably on some occasions. I mean, they don't obviously like want to encourage drunkenness amongst their kids, but I think you get the idea that there's cultural value there that's just totally foreign to how we would think about this in America. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are cultural differences in how you think about it. And so your family history and your own biases may also play a role in this. You know, I think the other thing you've got to think about are liability issues. You know, I've talked to a lot of parents, you know, is there is we're ha having this conversation. A lot of times what comes out is there is there's sort of that parent at their school or there's a couple of parents who are the ones that are hosting the big parties at homecoming or prom or and where there's an enormous amount of, of alcohol consumption going on in those homes. And, you know, a lot of the parents, other parents have sort of a negative, uh, you know, attitude about that. And so one of the things you may have to ask yourself is if you want to be that parent, there's sort of a labeling thing that goes on in addition to the liability, right? Because if the kids are using in your home and something bad happens, I'm not an attorney, but I do believe that there's some significant liability issues you really need to think about, um, you know, if you're, if you're deciding you're going to host that. Um, host that sort of activities under your roof. Again, you know, for, for all those reasons, I think it's just generally not the right thing to be doing. But I also, you know, I, I, you know, people come from different backgrounds and have a different experience of things. And, you know, who am I to say that in some situations, some circumstances, you know, with the right sort of in parental sort of consent, you know, at least within reason that maybe that could, that could, you know, be an effective, you know, way to approach it. Um, you know, my bias is there's probably just generally not the thing to do. Um, and, and part of that is because of number four in here, which is that you have to consider this, right? There's an overarching theme here and it's whatever you permit, you promote. And if you've gotten far enough into the Your Successful Teen program, you'll know I talk about that quite a bit, right? If you're hosting parties in your home where there's drugs and alcohol being consumed, what's the message you're sending your kids, right? You're kind of saying to them that it's okay if you use drugs and alcohol. And I get that in your mind, you may be saying, well, you know, I'm saying you can do it at home, right? Well, I said you could do it in our basement. I did say you could just do it anywhere, anytime. But again, that's your parent logic. It's not necessarily the logic of your teenager, right? The logic of your teenager is, yeah, my parents cool with it. My, my, my mom and dad are cool with it. They don't care if I'm using. And they can then extrapolate that, that when they are out with their friends or they're driving around or there are parties, that you kind of don't really care. Um, so you have to, I think, really factor that whatever you permit, you promote logic into this conversation around drugs and alcohol. Hot topic number two, should you tell them what you did in college? Um, the picture, if you haven't seen this movie, is old school, which is quite a funny movie. Um, but it's about, it's kind of about these older, older guys who go back to college and kind of, you know, um, behave inappropriately. Like, let's put it that way. Will Ferrell comedy. Um, so you can kind of get the idea there. Um, you know, so should you tell them what you did in college? You know, if many of us were sort of of a generation when, you know, went to college and part of the college experience was partying and having fun. Um, you know, and there's sort of a double, there's sort of a role modeling double edged sword here, right? Like if you share exactly what you did, maybe you're modeling a permissive attitude that it's just okay. Well, you did it, right? I mean, this is, it's very normal that parents, kids are going to ask their parents, well, did you drink alcohol? Did, did you ever smoke pot? It's a pretty normal question, and they're probably going to start asking it again around that seventh to eighth grade age. From my experience, is when those questions start to creep in. So that's the double edge, right? If you, on the one hand you say, "Oh yeah, well I did," um, even if you say, "You know, I don't, I don't do it anymore, and I don't think it's the right thing to be doing," or "I only tried it a couple of times," you know, there's sort of that sense of, you know, maybe you're being permissive in saying, you know, giving your kids the thought process. Well, if my mom and dad it did it and they, they, they came out okay, then maybe it's okay if I try it, right? You sort of want to be careful around that logic. The double-edged sword here is, of course, if you tell them you didn't, let's say you did, you know, experiment or sort of have a, a party-filled sort of college experience or even just a little bit, right? If you say to them, I didn't, but you did, then you're role modeling dishonesty, right? 
So it's, I'm not saying that I have the easy answer to this question, but I'm at least trying to point out what I think are some of the, the tricky, sort of the, the tightrope, you know, if you will, that you have to walk here at this. Here's where I generally land on it. Be honest within reason. I don't, they certainly don't need to know all the details of, you know, some of the, the big parties you may have gone to in college or frat parties or, you know, whatever, whatever right? I don't think we need to talk too much more about that, but they don't need all the, the details. You know, save that for your friends, you know, for your reunions with your friends and getting together. You know, if there are those sort of stories, um, you know, hidden in the vault, um, you know, save that for the time when you're, when you're, you know, rehashing old memories and having laughs with your friends, right? Um, you know, obviously it's not just not the time, you know, so I think there's, there's a way to be honest within reason. Um, you know, if you just sort of say, no, I never did any of that. And they, and they, and they find out later that you did, then it kind of puts you in a, in a pretty awkward spot of having been dishonest. Um, you know, if they overhear some of those conversations with those friends who are maybe over for dinner sometime, or just, if, you know, usually also kids have a, you know, they, they, they kind of, they can kind of sniff out the truth often. Um, not always, but often. Um, so I think being honest within reason, you know, I think, but really more than anything, this creates a good platform to honestly share how you feel now, you know, like, you know, maybe I did experiment with some of that stuff, but it was really kind of stupid. And I, and I actually regret that I did, um, you know, it wasn't the right thing for me to be doing. Um, or, you know, I feel like, you know, yeah, maybe I did sort of, you know, have some of those experiences in college, but I think I could have gotten a lot further. I think I would have been healthier. I think I would have, you know, whatever you want us to think about it is this is an opportunity to really share how you feel about it now. Again, it kind of comes back to what we said before, you're planting seeds. I also think this is a good opportunity to be asking questions to keep them talking. You know, it doesn't have to be so much about what do you share with them, but the question becomes, well, well, what do you think about this? Well, what do you know your friends are doing? Kind of going back before, like a lot of this is sort of this question, almost Socratic sort of approach, right? Like a lot of them in the form of questions, you know, what do you think about this? You know, what do you think are the real risks of smoking pot? What do you think are the risks of drinking? What do you, what do you know of your, what are your friends doing? You know, the kids in your school that you know are smoking pot. What do you, what do you think about them? There's a whole bunch of questions you can ask here that will keep them talking, which by and large is what you want to do, right? The whole idea is to keep the lines of communication open here. And part of that is to keep them talking. So that's a lot of what you really need to do. Hot topic. What should you do if you catch them using? Well, again, every family is going to be different, you know, approach this different. And I think that, you know, really more than anything, you want to strike while the iron's hot here and use it as an opportunity to have an honest conversation with them about their decision making, you know, really more than anything, like about the decisions they're making. I think it's an opportunity to talk about the natural consequences, you know, as they're appropriate to your family's values. And what I mean by that is, you know, if they're using you know, there may be a loss of privileges. Like, hey, listen, we don't trust you using the car for the next few months because, you know, you, just because of the choices you made. You know, you came home completely drunk the other day. You know, maybe you weren't driving, but it still is about, it's, it's, it's about decision making and it's a judgment issue. And it's just the reality is, is if we're going to let you use the family car, then we need to trust you. We need to feel confident that you can make good decisions. Um, so that's an example of, you know, how this can just start to lead to just honest, authentic conversations about the natural consequences of their behavior. And I also think it's sort of implicit here that one of the biggest conversations that you have to have with them is about trust. Like in many ways, that's really what this is about, right? Okay, so you went out and we, and we came home smelling like alcohol or you came home drunk or we found some marijuana in your drawer, right? Or your, whatever the situation is. What does that mean about your trust in them? And those are not easy conversations to have, but they're important conversations to have. And if you catch them using, this is a very fertile time to have that conversation, right? What, do, what, how, how does this impact your trust? And be really honest with them about it. You know, if you, if this is, if this leads to a serious, if this really diminishes your trust, you need to be open with them and honest with them about that. Make them sit with that. Let them sit with that. That's appropriate. You know, that's a natural consequence to making some bad decisions. Make them sit with that. The last one here is, again, keeping the channels of communication open, right? Like, even if this happens, it's not ideal, but it could also be a real opportunity to keep, that, keep the communication open so that they'll, they'll be honest with you about what's going on. 
Um, you know, I think you can, I think it's also important to differentiate your disappointment in their choices versus them, right? So, you know, we don't stop loving you. We don't, we don't dislike you, but we're not happy about your choices. You know, we believe in you as a person and your character, but we don't agree with the choices you're making. Because ultimately the question is, is how do they learn from this, right? How do you have this as a constructive conversation with them so that they learn from it? Um, so that's, you know, I think an important thing if you catch them using. Hot topic, what if they get caught by the police for using? Know your plan in advance and communicate it to them, right? Like I think this is just important just to, to have as a part of that conversation, right? Like what if they get arrested with their friends out at three o'clock in the morning and there's marijuana in the car? Or if they're drinking, like, you know, some parents, you know, I've worked with parents that the, the, the parents' biggest frustration was that the, the, the child, that the teen found the dad's pot stash and stole some of it without asking. Now, Maybe you shake your head at that, or maybe you know you can kind of relate to that. Again, I'm not sitting. I understand that the way in which parents are going to think about this topic is there's going to be a big range here, right? You know, we live in again, things are changing in the way society is thinking about it, right? It's not legalized in a number of parts of the country because you know everybody has a very um, you know restrictive thinking about it. I, I get that that is reflective of how we think about it. So. You know, some parents, you know, aren't that troubled by their kids smoking pot. For them, it's really more about, you know, degree and about, you know, frequency. Is it, you know, they don't mind if a kid's smoking pot a little bit, but they don't, but they don't want them smoking all the time. Again, however you think about it, you know, and what your values are has to factor into how you're talking about it. But one of these talking points, one of these conversation topics that I think needs to come up early on is what if you're out there and you get caught using by the police? right? Are you going to go bail them out? Meaning this is a question for you, mom and dad. Will you go bail them out at three o'clock in the morning? Will you hire a lawyer for them? Um, I think, you know, it's important. You can say that it's important for them to know where you stand on this. You know, you may say to them that, you know, hey, listen, you know, I know we can't control it. And, you know, I prefer you're not, you know, out there using, but if you are, you know, I, I understand maybe I can't control it completely. But if you get picked up, you're out with your friends and there's pot in the car or you're underage drinking and you guys get caught and they take you down to, to jail, expect that you're going to spend the night there and sleep on a hard bench and I'll be there to get you in the morning. Now, what you ultimately do if that situation were come to pass is entirely up to you. You know, you may just decide that the right thing to do is to go pick them up at three o'clock in the morning. And I'm not going to argue with you that that's the wrong choice necessarily. I think it depends on your situation. Probably also depends on where you are. If it's inner city Chicago versus, you know, a suburb in a more rural place, that's probably also going to factor into, you know, how you're thinking about where they're, where, where you're going to let them endure to, to learn a lesson. But I think it's important to communicate that to them in advance. If you're at least thought processes, Hey, I'm not coming if you. If you make a bad choice and you get caught and you're at three o'clock in the morning, like don't expect me to come get you. you you're going to spend the night and I'll come get you at eight o'clock after I've gotten up and, you know, had a cup of coffee. Um, then we'll deal with it. Um, or, you know, if you do this, you're going to have to, you know, I'm, I'm not, don't expect that I'm just going to hire a lawyer for you and spend a bunch of money. You're going to have to work community service and, you know, pay, pay, you know, pay the price, so to speak, of the choices you make. Again, I don't, I'm not saying that there's one right answer here, but I do think that it's important to think through for yourselves between you and your spouse, what, what is our position on this and communicate that to them so that they at least have to sit with that because that will hopefully shape the choices that they're going to make. And again, come to one other point here is whatever you permit, you promote, right? If you say to them, I've seen a lot of families, let me put it this way, that their kids have gotten busted on a number of occasions for marijuana and for more, even harder drugs. And the parents always bail them out, right? They're, they hire lawyers, they, you know, come to the rescue and, you know, keep, you know, they, the kids get a lecture, but, but they keep also getting bailed out, right? So there's, that's where the whatever you permit, you promote principle comes in. Because what are you teaching them? What's the lesson that they're getting, right? Whatever you permit, you promote. So those are the hot topics. That's really what I have to share with you on the topic um, here today, uh, here tonight. Just a quick review of the key points. Accept that exposure to drugs and alcohol is a reality of the world we live in. Again, it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when they're going to get that exposure. Number two, the strength of your relationship with them is the most important thing. Of all the other things we're going to talk about, the open channels of communication with them 
is the most important thing when it comes to they're going to be talking to somebody about this issue. You know, you just hope that you're a part of that conversation. That's your ultimate goal here. Let them know what you think about things, right? Be honest with them about how you feel about it, but don't close down the channel of communication, right? You want, again, you want them talking to you. And to the extent that you can, you want to keep them busy and engaged in healthy and positive activities. That's critically important. As much as you can, you want to keep them engaged in healthy and positive stuff. And use the, use the communication strategies that I've talked about here in this module. Um, so that is it. I thank you very much. Um, this is again just this is Joshua signing off on the module about how to talk to your teens about drugs and alcohol in the Your Successful Teen program. I hope you found this to be a common sense approach, and I hope that there's some really useful things that you can use in your interactions with your teenagers around this topic. Thank you very much. Bye for now, and look forward to sharing more material with you in the other modules. Bye bye.